Thank you for that introduction, um, and, and thank you all for coming today. I'm grateful to Nick um, and Ray for the invitation and the warm welcome, and also to Bill for um, taking care of all the logistical details and making my visit go smoothly. Um, so lately, I have been reading the letters of uh, fort commanders in Brazil, namely the letters of Portuguese uh, officials stationed at military outposts, quite remote ones, um, that were all along the upper Paraguay River. Um, and in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, these fort commanders wrote prolifically about Spaniards, uh, their imperial rivals in these borderlands. Um, but what has kept my interest in this kind of vast military correspondence is that they also wrote a great deal about the Guaycuru their indigenous allies. Um, this quote from a fort commander's letter to the colonial governor in 1802 will give you a sense of the tone of this correspondence. Um, so the topic is a subgroup of Guaycuru um, known as the Cajueo. Um, and these had, this group had recently allied with the Portuguese and had taken up kind of temporary seasonal residence at Coimbra Fort on the, on the Paraguay River. Um, so the fort commander writes, these vacillating men yield to one side today, and tomorrow they lean toward the other. Very crafty, they know how to take advantage of friendship with us and with the Spaniards, selling it to both nations, often lying, and at other times telling the truth everything an abyss of confusion. And the fort commander then signed off um, his letter with what had kind of become a refrain at the end of his correspondence. And he wrote, for now, this is all I have to report hastily to your excellency, the governor. I say hastily because from barely sunrise until sunset, the Cadubeos do not give me a moment's rest, asking for things with the greatest nuisance and impertinence. Um, when historians read letters like these, um, we of course see them as distorted by the prejudices of their authors. So clearly the fort commander distrusted Indians, um, and um, especially the Guaycuru, um, and among them the Cajuveo. Um, and in calling them vacillating, he was definitely reproducing this kind of old, familiar stereotype of the inconstant Indian. Um, whose loyalties were fickle um, and whose plans were inscrutable. And in describing their incessant requests at the end there, um, he was echoing the complaints of generations of missionaries and other colonial officials who were basically charged with um, you know, maintaining this costly peace with indigenous allies. Um, we can also assume that colonial officials often misread as fickleness what was really just the result of many different bands of indigenous peoples um, making, you know, each pursuing different local interests and strategies. But I wonder if in focusing on these things that I have just mentioned, if we perhaps miss the ways in which Indians actively shaped the images and refrains in this correspondence. So perhaps many Guaycuru wanted to be seen as particularly demanding and even irritating allies. And maybe there were real advantages to be had in keeping the commander uncertain about their loyalty and guessing about their, their permanence on the Portuguese side of the border. So in this talk, um, I'm going to suggest to you that the Guaycuru actually cultivated a reputation for troublesomeness, for lack of a better word, um, and inconstancy, which is the word that was often um, applied to them, in their interactions and, and um, yeah, in their interactions with colonial officials. So first, I'd like to give you just a little background on this particular group, um, on the Guaycuru. Originally, this, um, this equestrian society 
lived in the Chaco, in what is now northern Paraguay. And there they raided Spanish ranches for livestock, um, horses, um, being an equestrian society, and increasingly over time cattle. They forged a few short-lived alliances with Spaniards on that side of the border, um, and they even experimented very briefly with Jesuit mission life. Um, but in the late 18th century, um, some Guaycuru bands decided to move across this, the border, which for most of this period followed the course of the Paraguay River, um, and they began to cross over um, to the Portuguese claimed or eastern side of the river, of the border, um, to take refuge there from Spanish punitive expeditions that were sent against them in the wake of raids. Um, so you see, I don't know if you can read this, but you have the Guaycuru here and then dates. So you have them down here in the 1500s, and then you can see the dates are becoming gradually later. They're moving north by the 1700s um, and even further north and to the eastern side um, of, into Portuguese claimed territories in what is now Brazil um, by the um, late 18th century and early 19th century. Um, and that um, where they ended up, um, the Guaycuru and this subgroup that's marked as Caduveo, or as it's written now, Cajiveo, um, where they ended up is now in the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso do Sul, southern Mato Grosso, um, in what is now, um, uh, actually tourists go there a lot because it's the largest tropical wetlands in the world, the Pantanal wetlands. If you have any birder friends, you know that they talk a lot about, they dream of going to the Pantanal. Um, from the Portuguese um, imperial perspective, this kind of indigenous population transfer was highly desirable. Um, so in the context of border disputes with Spain, um, having the Guaycuru as allies would help them assert and, and legally kind of back up um, claims to the territory surrounding the Paraguay River um, and perhaps beyond. Um, and while they were at it, the Portuguese could obtain a nice supply of mostly stolen livestock um, via these new indigenous allies. Um, this helps explain why, in 1791, a formal peace treaty was signed between two major bands of Guaycuru and the Portuguese. And this treaty lasted for more than three decades. It was, it was sort of renewed at one point. But it basically lasted until the 1820s. And in that treaty, the Guaycuru promised to uphold, quote, the most intimate, intimate peace and friendship with the Portuguese and to give their loyalty and obedience to the king. And in exchange, because I'd also like to think about why the Guaycuru would enter into this, the governor promised to always protect the Guaycuru and do, quote, all that was needed for their spiritual and material satisfaction. Um, the historian David Weber once drew a distinction between colonial treaties of capitulation, which tended to be signed with relatively weak indigenous groups, and treaties that, on the other hand, recognize indigenous sovereignty, and which were usually signed with more formidable um, native groups. Um, this one that I'm talking about in 1791 was definitely the latter type of treaty. Um, it defined the Guaycuru formally as Indian vassals, but they, they definitely retained a kind of de facto independence um, under the terms of this treaty. Um, so we are talking about here, um, we are talking about still autonomous native peoples um, in the sense that they were not brought into missions. Um, or compelled to live in, in any kind of sedentary village, um, and in that they were not subject to forced labor. They weren't subject to the, the state labor draft. Um, now, of course, the principal aims of colonial peace treaties with indigenous groups were, one, to neutralize the threat presented by these formidable indigenous groups, um, two, obtain more allies than their imperial rivals, as I mentioned, to back up these territorial claims, and three, to make these Indians into subjects whose land could be appropriated and, and labor could be appropriated. Um, 
But what I'd like to suggest to you today is that this process of incorporation and subjugation um, took a very long time, extending well into the 19th century, um, or it was only partially successful um, in this part of Brazil, as in many other parts of the hemisphere. Um, and just to drive this point home, um, this was something that kind of stopped me in the tracks when I first read this, um, this estimate uh, you know, by scholars that um, around the year 1800, that, uh, that um, autonomous native peoples effectively controlled half to two thirds of the continental territory of the Americas, in the plural. So circa 1800. And there's, that's not just one scholar who has, you know, this is David Weber, this is Juliana Barr, Amy Turner Bushnell, like a number of scholars have kind of gotten behind that estimate. Of course, we don't have exact numbers, but just that sense of um, this process of subjugation of native peoples, of incorporation being, um, taking a very long time and being incomplete for longer than we might assume. So over the couple of decades, that followed the peace agreement of 1791. Thousands of Guaycuru, um, along with some allied indigenous groups, as well as huge herds of horses, thousands of horses, um, came to live in the vicinity of three Portuguese military outposts on the upper Paraguay. Um, and they came during the low water season. You see, they still could cross the rivers with their huge herds of horses in the, in the higher water season. Uh, but the, this whole area of the wetlands were more easily traversed in these large groups um, during the low water season. Um, and their interactions, and I would, I would say in their intrigues with Portuguese military officials, produced a kind of huge documentary record, um, much of which has survived in the regional archives in Mato Grosso. So why might the Guaycuru have wanted to be perceived as demanding and even obnoxious visitors and friends. Uh, one reason is that this perception extended the supply of gifts and rations um, far beyond the period of initial peacemaking um, in 1791. So by the end of the century, there were some 800 Guaycuru living near Coimbra Fort and, and visiting the fort regularly, along with about 600 Guana Indians, um, many of whom were considered captives of the Guaycuru. Um, and I'll mention that again later. Um, this total number of Indian visitors at the fort um, doubled, nearly doubled several years later. And at that point in 1803, the Portuguese estimated that the Guaycuru had received some 16 to 20,000 cruzados worth of goods over their 12 years of living in, quote, the most intimate friendship with the Portuguese. Um, and officials um, even began to wonder, the Portuguese wondered this as well as their Spanish counterparts on the other side of the border, began to wonder if they were in fact paying tribute to an Indian nation. So tribute's supposed to always go in the opposite direction. Now you begin to see multiple colonial officials grappling with this idea that maybe they were paying reverse tribute um, to the Guaycuru in this case. Um, Guaycuru demands also ensured the supply of certain kinds of goods. So the, the fort commanders frequently passed along Indians' demands to the governor. Um, they wanted red cloth instead of the more readily available yellow cloth. They wanted new, not used, uh, axes and knives, salt and lard with which to flavor their food. Um, and um, apparently they had become accustomed to um, using those kinds of uh, uh, flavorings since living near the Portuguese. And always they asked for more alcohol and more tobacco. They know, sorry, they well know the value of all the things they receive, noted one commander, but when given alcohol, for example, Quote, they say that it is simply peed out. The food is similarly excreted. The cloth and fabric, they say, has been worn out or torn. Sorry, the other cloth and fabric has been torn. The iron tools are worn out. And likewise, the rest. The Guaycuru captains, as, as the caciques or the sort of headmen were called, um, along with their wives and extended family members, 
also expected to be hosted by the commander um, in his quarters at the fort and to eat at his dinner table each, each day, um, as indeed they were during the dry season over the course of more than a decade. And I know this because, um, because of the many letters by fort commanders in which they complained about this kind of daily, seasonal but daily um, imposition. Um, these visiting Waikuru dignity, dignity, sorry, dignitaries may have in fact outnumbered the several dozen Portuguese soldiers who were stationed at this fort in any given moment. Um, at these dinners, colonial officials learned to privilege the Guaycuru over their other less demanding native allies, um, such as the Guana. Um, one commander noted that the Guaycuru captains and their families expected to eat whatever he ate at, at his table, while the visiting Guana had to sit on the floor with only plates of plain beans. This distinction between the two groups um, could even be quantified. So you have that same commander noting that he was always very careful to adhere to a proportional division of alcohol, um, whereby he always gave 10 times more alcohol to the Guaycuru than to the Guana. Um, one list of, of these, these so-called gastos gingios, like um, Indian expenses, um, you know, this one covers expenditures at the Coimbra Fort over almost three years in the early 19th centuries. Um, this list, this just this one list, included a whopping 2,200 gallons of manioc flour, which is a you know, dietary staple, um, and seven, roughly 750 gallons of beans, uh, roughly 400 pounds of lard, and many other foodstuffs. Um, there were also about 300 shipments of alcohol, almost a thousand units of tobacco, um, different kinds of textiles and beads, um, and a large variety of tools um, and other hardware. And just this one list in all contained 51 different categories of goods that were given to the Guaycuru and the allied Guana in proportionally less, you know, proportionally smaller quantities um, at the fort between 1800 and, and 1802. Um, in their correspondence, officials lamented shortages in these products, um, which caused such a stir among the Guaycuru. So one commander describes how if anything was denied, but especially the alcohol and tobacco, um, the Guaycuru, he said, grow melancholy, and then they shout that it must be given to them because your excellency, the governor, only sends it for them. And the only way to kind of quell or you know, put down these protests, he said, was to show them the empty warehouses, like open the doors of the, of the warehouses at the fort and show them that there was nothing in there to give them. Um, as soon as our supplies run out, fretted another commander, I am quite convinced that they will abandon our alliance. Um, and so you have commanders constantly pleading for not only more supplies to give to the Guaycuru, but better ones, more desirable ones. Um, it, you know, and to ship those from the capital to this kind of remote military outpost on the Paraguay River. They also continued to send elite Guaycuru um, to be feted and entertained in the capital, even after the governor ordered that these very expensive visits be discouraged. They continued to send these, these captain, Guaycuru captains or caciques to the capital. Um, why did these visits continue? Um, I think it's clear that they continued because the Guaycuru insisted. They wanted to deal directly with the governor. Um, they were, as one commander put it, determined to go to the capital. Quote, they showed up at the fort without their wives and said that they wanted to go, profit, and return. Um, one Guaycuru captain even said, according to this fort commander, that, quote, either he would go on this occasion to embrace the knees of His Excellency in the capital, or he would never see the Portuguese again. Now, um, I'm going to take a brief detour here to say that anthropologists studying patterns of exchange among hunter-gatherer horticulturalists have called this demand sharing. Um, and I think this is a really useful concept for us to think about um, 
back in the colonial period, um, the anthropologists have described demand sharing as a way of testing a relationship or asserting a claim in an uncertain or shifting social context. Um, and Elizabeth Ewart, who is an anthropologist working among the, among the Panara um, in central Brazil, reflected in two, 2013 that, quote, like many anthropologists, I experienced an often unrelenting and sometimes materially as well as emotionally draining stream of demands from Panara people. It seemed that no matter what I brought and how hard I tried to ensure that all who asked received something, there would always be somebody who would point out that she had no beads left, that her flip-flops were worn out, or that the cooking pot was old and broken. And why had I not brought more beads, some new flip-flops, or a new cooking pot? Um, so there are some really interesting echoes here. When I first read that, I was kind of struck by some of the, the resonance with these colonial sources. And what's interesting is that Ewart and other anthropologists who have studied um, studied this this phenomenon have, you know, they've made clear that it's not just these indigenous groups need these material items, um, nor is it about just holding outsiders to some kind of ideal of indigenous reciprocity. So they've shown that rather this is about establishing difference. Um, so Ewart um, notes that the Panara never demand things directly from one another in this fashion you know, uh, amongst themselves. This is something you do with outsiders. Um, and it's also about maintaining autonomy. So if outsiders are good only as long as they are materially useful, um, as, as another anthropologist put it, Beth Conklin, then their power, in a sense, over indigenous peoples is limited. Um, does that make sense? It's a bit of a, bit of a stretch. I couldn't resist the throwing that picture in, it's one of my favorite images of the Panara. Um, it has been useful for me, I will say, to, to read the anthropology and think about how, some, how we might find echoes or parallels in the colonial sources, um, although of course some caution is needed there. I have nonetheless found it useful. So if you'll remember the native captain who said that he would never see the Portuguese again if he did not get to go be feted in the capital, um, this is, um, this is what brings me to the other aspect of their reputation that I think the Guaycuru seem to want to cultivate. Um, and that's this idea of inconstancy. Um, so why then would they want to be seen as fickle, fickle friends? Um, I think it is because the Guaycuru did not want their political loyalty to be taken for granted. Um, and rather, they wanted to make sure that this was something that had to be nurtured through Portuguese effort and accommodation and generosity, as I've talked about, over the years. Um, so the Guaycuru frequently reminded the Portuguese of the silver and cattle and beads that they had received from the Spaniards, threatening to return to their former territories on the Spanish claim side of the border. Um, the greatest difficulty that I find, wrote a Portuguese governor to a Coimbra commander, has to do with the locale in which they live, between Portuguese and Spaniards, who ceaselessly seek to attract them into friendship. They manipulate these contrary aims with great shrewdness, and in this way they obtain what they want from both, without either work or subjection. So as various bands of Waikuru alternated between raiding and trading, and I thought of another one, evading, right, um, and negotiating with their rivals, um, the Portuguese were left wondering about the fate of this alliance um, and the territorial claims that depended on it. Um, this I like to think of as that abyss of, confu abyss of confusion in the earlier quote, the first quote I showed you. Um, Another uh, fort commander claimed that when visiting the, the fort, the Guaycuru pretended not to speak or even understand a word of Portuguese, so as he claimed to better eavesdrop upon their friends at the fort. 
And only when intoxicated, he said, did they show their true fluency in Portuguese. Um, they were also thought to have a kind of secret pidgin language, um, one that could not even be understood by non Guaycuru who, who had lived among them for many years. Um, and the commander thought that they used this kind of secret language whenever they had to discuss something really um, you know, secretive or sensitive. And when I first came across that um, in a source, I, I was puzzled by it. Um, and I've actually sensed that the other kind of main group that I'm studying, the Mura in the, in the Amazon, um, were also said to have this kind of secret guttural language that they used for, for very sensitive discussions and that was not, um, that outsiders were not allowed to learn. So this is something I, I definitely want to look more into. Um, more than 20 years after the peace agreement of 1791, um, another Coimbra commander was convinced that one of the main protagonists of, of that peace agreement, um, the elderly chief, um, his name was Paulo Joaquin José Ferreira, um, he was, this commander was convinced that this guy was living as a spy among the Portuguese at the fort. Um, he described him as, as too old to go raiding in Spanish territories with the rest of his band. Um, and so he remained at the fort, eager, quote, to spread to his entire nation all the intelligence that he can gather around here. Um, and the irony of, the great irony of this, of course, is that the Portuguese wanted to keep the Guaycuru under surveillance at the fort, um, but found it very difficult to do so given their frequent absences. Um, and of course, these examples I've just given you, you can tell that they are tinged with Portuguese paranoia, right? The secret language, the spy amongst them. Um, but I think, you know, we have enough of these descriptions to see that the Guaycuru were, in a sense, playing on colonial assumptions about their inconstancy for their own gain. Um, so the sources make clear that the Guaycuru used this new, more secure base of operations in Brazil, at these military outposts, um, to conduct raids, continuing raids, on Spanish ranches and also yerba mate plantations. Um, they also went on taking captives among less powerful indigenous groups, um, such as the, the Xamacoco, um, while maintaining their long-standing, what's been described as a symbiotic relationship with the more agricultural guana that I mentioned before. Um, and as the quote and, and image um, on the slide suggest, um, these activities were ongoing um, well into the 19th century, even in the late 19th century, um, which is when this is the descendant group of this, that subgroup of the Guaycuru, the Cajibeo, who are the, the surviving descendant group um, that ended up on the, what is now Brazil, on the, in this time, Portuguese claim side of the border. Um, Portuguese efforts to prevent these controversial border crossings, um, mainly through licensing requirements, uh, usually failed, as I, I guess you can predict. Um, when officials did manage to dissuade the Guaycuru from going on a planned raid, um, they had to, they said, dispense or distribute large quantities of desirable trade goods so that they could not, so the Guaycuru could not allege necessity for, for the raid. Um, Guaycuru bands that had successfully pillaged goods on the Spanish side mocked the Portuguese upon their return, saying, quote, with irony, that they had only gotten rich because they had gone over to Spain. Um, the Guaycuru were similarly adamant about choosing their own settlement sites. Um, so one revealing moment came in 1796 when colonial officials pressured the Guaycuru to transfer all of what they called their aldeas volantes, which is like a literally like flying villages, but it's, it's like these mobile encampments. Um, the term in, in Spanish would, would be tolderias. Um, they pressured them to transfer these mobile, seasonally occupied villages or encampments to the eastern side of the Paraguay River because those lands were, as officials put it, positively Portuguese, right? Not as much in dispute. Whereas the western side remained very much in dispute with Spain. However, the Portuguese had actually founded Coimbra Fort on the western bank of the river, right on the river, but on the western side. So thus the Guaycuru 
responded rather provokingly, quote, that when the Portuguese move to the Eastern Bank, they will do so as well. Um, responses like this, you can imagine, um, led many Portuguese officials on the ground to write rather pessimistically, I think that's a bit of a euphemism even, um, to write pessimistically about the chances of ever settling the Guaycuru permanently and in conformity with colonial aims. They, um, they wander in a labyrinth of Indians. One fort commander wrote about a Guaycuru group that was headed across the border in which everything is hidden by their dissimulation. Um, clearly this labyrinth bewildered Portuguese frontier commanders, but in an environment of intense competition with Spain, they had to keep trying to please and accommodate uh, their indigenous allies. The Guaycuru made the most of this situation and were able to reap benefits from it for several decades in the late colonial period. So in this talk, I've, I've suggested that Borderlands military correspondence was shaped not just by colonial preoccupations and prejudices, but actually by the Guaycuru themselves. Um, historians, I would say, are, are used to reading colonial sources in ways that their authors never intended. Um, for example, we commonly read these sources for evidence of indigenous resistance. But I think we can also see in these sources how indigenous groups manipulated their own reputations as resistant and formidable peoples. Thank you.